20 weeks, Times Network, India's most influential television network, drove riveting conversations with some of the best minds from across key focus sectors to build a roadmap for India's growth trajectory. What are some of the issues that challenge the Indian economy? Coal is something that we have to worry about. All those uh, areas uh, which are linked to crude, they will see an impact. What are the government's growth stimulation strategies? It is in the interest of the economy to give stability in policy and it is in the interest of the economy to sustain the growth. The feedback we are getting from MSMEs is, is a level of optimism. What are some of the key tenets of India's growth story? What is important is to create sustainable uh, income for people which can only be done from job creation. And can India successfully navigate the economic headwinds that she faces? The ball has to be moved to the entrepreneur. The government has not addressed both the issue, fiscal prudence as well as the growth also. We address them all as the Punjab National Bank presents Times Network India Growth Mission. As leading minds from across India's business, policy and economic landscape came together to crystallize key action points for a comprehensive growth story to protect and build India's robust economy. As we bring this season to a close, we take a look at how India can turn uncertainty into an opportunity. Hello and welcome to the grand finale of Punjab National Bank presents Times Network India Growth Mission. I'm Tamanna Namdar. Through the last several weeks, we've been bringing you stories of India's growth, resilience and recovery, especially after COVID-19. While that pace of recovery has been commendable, we're now facing headwinds from every quarter. There is a war going on between Russia and Ukraine, which is impacting supply chains. On the other hand, we're seeing inflation, which is becoming difficult to beat back. Well, the truth is this is something that people around the world, nations around the world, and economies around the world are facing. The question we're posing today is how will India fare compared to the rest? Can we emerge stronger and quickly move to the growth that we all expect and anticipate. First, let me go across to my colleague Mihir Bhatt to set the context. Welcome to this special episode of uh, India Growth Mission. I have a very special guest with me. I have uh, Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal with me joining on this special broadcast. Uh, Mr. Sanyal, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for being part of this special initiative at Times Network called India Growth Mission. You know, our mission throughout the series has been uh, basically focusing on the main growth areas that India can actually capitalize on to uh, uh, sort of uh, develop a long-term growth uh, you know, trajectory. Uh, keeping that in mind, uh, and the current state where we are right now, while in the short term there are some headwinds in terms of the global inflationary pressures, uh, the war in Ukraine, its impact on commodity prices, and obviously uh, the, the disruption which is still continuing in global supply chain in, in some form of the, uh, or the other, at least in the short term, uh, how concerned are you about uh, the global growth situation in Indian context? Well, there's no doubt that uh, inflation globally is a major issue. Um, and here in India, we are also seeing some part of that flow through uh, to prices. Uh, I mean, we are an energy uh, importing country, so we can't be insulated from global oil prices. And of course, other commodities are also high. So in that sense, uh, you know, uh, we in the government certainly are taking, uh, uh, you know, watching these uh, uh, price rises with some concern on the energy front. Um, domestically driven inflation uh, is not really the issue in the case of India. Uh, our supply side is responding wherever possible. But wherever there are these um, imported uh, disruptions, whether it's for oil, but there are also for things like chips, for example, where uh, you know, there are disruptions which are f filtering through to sectors like automobiles. We do need to be cognizant of the fact that uh, you know, these are pressures uh, that we need to take into account. Now, what can we do? Well, one is keep our supply side, at least internally, so that uh, it, uh, you know, the, the uh, feed through is as minimal as possible. 
very importantly, maintain macroeconomic control. This is very, very critical for the medium term, whether it's in terms of money supply uh, or um, you know domestic interest rates. So you've already seen the Reserve Bank has preemptively begun to uh, increase interest rates, and uh, and you know money supply in India even through the cycle of the pandemic where many other countries may have gone overboard with their monetary easing we maintain money supply growth at reasonably uh, uh, you know controlled levels so all of that means that from a macroeconomic stability perspective things are in control but yes we are a part of the uh, rest of the world and uh, we have to be cognizant that there will be some feed through to us right uh, i want to basically focus on the long term scenario and from that point of view, I think one thing which has emerged very clearly post pandemic and even now continues to evolve uh, is world's attention uh, on China plus one policy, the continuing disruption of various supply chains in China and India's emergence as a very stable, uh, predictable, growth oriented economy. Now, if we keep uh, you know all these factors together, then uh, there is a good case for Indian economy to remain in a high growth trajectory scenario for a couple of years to come. As a country, how do we capitalize on that? You're absolutely right that uh, global supply chains are indeed diversifying and India is an obvious country to take advantage of that. Uh, I think uh, people are beginning to appreciate our uh, much more stable democratic uh, uh, political system. Uh, they're also appreciating the large number of uh, supply chain uh, improvements we have done not only in terms of external but even internally inside the country in terms of building up the in, uh, roads, highways, air networks and so on and also of course very importantly uh, being able to implement the GST system. Um, till very recently we were not a internally integrated market so we're not a common market you know we could go around the world and say India is a large market but in fact we were not a common market. So with the implementation of GST, we are able to then um, leverage our internal market. So all of this means that we are in a position to create scale, which is something that historically we were not very good at doing, particularly in the manufacturing sector. So infrastructure on one side, uh, building up a common market on the other side, and then using schemes like the PLI scheme in order to create scale. Again, an important uh, issue that we have all historically had is that in the name of uh, sort of uh, uh, protecting the MSME sector, we actually introduced all kinds of restrictions which actually uh, restricted them. So what we have done for the first time is create a PLI scheme which is really like a ladder for allowing medium-sized players to scale up very, very rapidly, even larger players to scale up to be even larger because if you want to be in the global scale, uh, you, you need to be able to, you know, have, you know, Chinese scale factories to be able to have those economies of scale. So it is important here, therefore, to understand that we are now thinking like a country that uh, uh, can be an uh, alternative. All this while, um, you know, we always restricted ourselves in various ways. And I think what is good in the last few years is that we are thinking in the correct scale, whether it's in terms of infrastructure, in terms of the policies and the ambition we have, and I think that those are beginning to pay off. Right. Uh, now, sir, I have a, a question about the current situation, which is obviously looks like a prolonged situation in terms of what is happening in Europe. And I'm not talking about the war, but the evolving scenario. World ran into the global pandemic crisis, then it ran into supply chain issues, which mainly emerged from China. Now it has run into this uh, so-called war. Then there are inflationary pressures. Now, obviously, uh, you know, some of these, uh, 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 I would say, triggers are going to have a much uh, lasting or a longer effect on the global economy. Uh, how is India placed in this whole uh, situation right now? One is I understand that people are looking at India as an alternate manufacturing destination or a supply chain port of sorts. But how are we placed otherwise in this global geopolitical come economic uh, scenario, if I can uh, put it like that? I think the important thing to be able to deal with an uncertain evolving world is that we need to engage with it, uh, keeping in mind our national interests uh, and also uh, being unapologetic about following those national interests. I think uh, you have seen, for example, whether it's the way we dealt with the RCEP issue. Um, 
you know, we felt that the RCEP didn't uh, fit into our national interests. Uh, there was a lot of pressure to go in and sign up for it. We didn't. But that doesn't mean we are sort of moving into some of inward looking, um, you know, import substitution kind of worldview. That's not at all true. We have pursued uh, free trade agreements with other countries. We recently signed one with Australia. We have done one with UAE. We are aggressively uh, pursuing uh, other ones, for example, with the UK. So it is not that we uh, do not recognize the evolving situation. We, we, we take a, a pragmatic view of what the options are at each point in time and evolve with it. Um, and the same thing has happened even with uh, the issue of uh, uh, you know, our um, uh, response to, to um, sanctions or otherwise with Russia. Um, you know, we, we stood our ground as far as importing uh, Russian uh, oil is concerned. Um, ironically, many of the critics of that policy are themselves importing uh, gas and oil from Russia on a much greater scale than we are. Um, but, you know, uh, in the past we would have quite easily caved in. Uh, what has changed is that we stand our ground when it, if it deals with our uh, interests and uh, I think people have begun to respect that. Absolutely. Sir, since you uh, mentioned uh, energy and, and this is a slightly short term uh, uh, you know, issue, or but I have this question, uh, that is basically the energy prices. The way uh, things are moving right now, uh, the crude is obviously hovering somewhere way above our comfort level and even above our budgetary estimates. Now, uh, maybe from, uh, from medium to long term view, it will settle down or it will adjust itself. But is it a concern, especially in the current uh, fiscal situation uh, where we have a couple of issues to tackle with? Well, as I mentioned earlier, we are an importer of oil. Uh, high oil prices are something that... Uh, hurts us, no question about it, and certainly oil prices in the range of $110 per barrel is something we in India are not happy about. Uh, but we have to deal with it uh, in, uh, in various ways, uh, particularly in terms of uh, the feed through to the general population. Um, we have limited scope for uh, maneuvering. Um, one of the things we did do back in November was to cut some of the taxes. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the states also cut taxes. Uh, maybe there's some, some of the states that didn't cut taxes then can now perhaps uh, follow through. But I think at some level we have to realize that whatever the feed through uh, we uh, allow, if we don't want that feed through to happen, there is a fiscal price somewhere we have to make an adjustment, whether it's in terms of cutting taxes or some other way. And each one of those measures has some um, price to be paid. I mean, at the margin, maybe we can buy some oil from Russia or some such thing, but frankly, in the end, we have to figure out a way of going, becoming much more independent of this imported oil problem. And, um, you know, as it happens to be, uh, we may not have a lot of hydrocarbons in India, but uh, we are uh, endowed with um, a lot of sunshine. So, certainly, uh, you know, Renewables is an area that is of interest to us. Uh, we also need to maintain a bouquet of other sources as well. So I am a votary that we should pursue seriously uh, nuclear power. And uh, of course, some amount of uh, uh, coal-based uh, electricity production also needs to be maintained in this country, uh, even into the future. So whether it's driven by domestic mining or by imports from Australia, uh, we do need to maintain a certain mix of energy uh, such that if any particular source of energy suddenly becomes expensive or difficult for whatever reason, we have other sources to make up for it. But of course, um, not merely for climactic reasons, but simply because of the nature um, of our um, you know, natural resources, um, pursuing um, Renewables, particularly solar, is something we need to do and sustain. When we are looking at uh, next 25 or even 50 years and, and the kind of potential that India holds right now, uh, how concerned are you about this, uh, the so-called federal structure? Because what happens is, in many cases, we have seen that the policies are announced and rolled out or projects are announced and rolled out by the central government. And in some cases, we have seen that the states will drag their feet in terms of land allocation, adopting to policies, uh, you know, from an 
फॉरन इन्वेस्टर पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू और और प्योरली फ्रॉम कॉन्फिडेंस पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू इट समटाइम्स बिकम्स अ सॉर्ट ऑफ अ डैम्पनर हाउ डू वी एड्रेस दैट वेल आई मीन दरियस रोल्स ऑफ डिफरेंट लेवल्स ऑफ गवर्नमेंट आर वेल लेड आउट देर आर थिंग्स ऑफ द सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट नीड्स टू डू एंड होपफुली वी आर डूइंग अ डिसेंट जॉब ऑफ इट इंसिडेंटली द स्पेसिफिक केस ऑफ of the legal system being upgraded a large section of that depends on the judiciary not even on the central government but yes things like municipal services in particular or local support for industry and business uh, in whether foreign or indian um, has to come at the at the state level or uh, even at the municipal level and it is true that uh, there is a fairly wide range of uh, outcomes depending on the state some states are clearly better at it than others are uh, for for different reasons now my own view is that uh, while there are certain amount of uh, sort of top down incentivization that the central government can do for specific things uh, i am a believer that ultimately you've got to allow democracy to work so this is not about you know wise mandarins of uh, planning commission or the prime minister's economic council or niti aayog uh, who you know are headmasters who must be telling what the state should do that is not at all the case ultimately the people of these individual states have to demand services and that's the only way it will work in a democracy so um, there is no easy way Uh, you know until people demand services and quality uh, you will you cannot ultimately resolve this issue so you know it it goes back to the core of that the good news is that people now have much better sources of information whether they travel more they have relative very often you will have relatives in different parts of the country uh, your social media all of this means that uh, people are getting much better uh, information than uh, access than they probably ever had and uh, presumably if one or two states do a lot better than the others then the news gets around so i think that ultimately is an important part of this and i'm so uh, you know i don't think it is about uh, people sitting in the center wielding a headmaster stick that is the ultimate way i'm i'm much more in favor of a decentralized bottom up approach uh, of competitiveness uh, that ultimately allows local governments to perform better absolutely sir i have last two questions the first one is about two major challenges that we and i think the entire southeast asia uh, faces uh, to some extent one is the climate crisis or the climate emergency as we call it uh, and the second in case of india is especially creating right kind of jobs for right kind of people because obviously i mean we we will end up creating a lot of jobs but the fact is we do need lot um, much more jobs than maybe what we create right now uh, in the formal sector uh, what is your uh, view on these two very critical issues because somewhere it will swing the needle for us in terms of uh, where we are 25 years down the line well as far as climate change is concerned it certainly is a important issue um, and incidentally uh, climate change is something that happens all the time throughout our history um, you know our first uh urban civilization the harappan civilization ultimately got destroyed by climate change and the drying up of a critical river so we know that climate change uh, is a very serious thing and does have major ramifications so i i certainly think that we need to not just think about mitigation but a lot more about adaptation uh, whether we like it or not uh, climate will now change and we are probably already well past the tipping point so we should be prepared Uh, for uh, major change and it requires us to be a lot more flexible on all kinds of things uh, for example on agricultural policy we do need to take a pay a lot more attention in terms of much more resilience uh, of crops rather than just growing more and more you know calories which is how we have currently set up our agricultural policy so crops like for example the millet crops which are much more resilient to uh, variation in climate Uh, are things that we need to take more seriously so as far as jobs is concerned certainly creating more and more jobs is an important part because as i said we need to deploy uh, more people in uh, new and emerging sectors uh, uh, this is critical because obviously we were also going through the demographic cycles uh, that uh, will you know for the next 20 25 odd years 
uh, create a disproportionate proportion of our population will be of working age and we need to be able to absorb them. So in that sense, it is very important that we uh, create jobs. Uh, however, uh, you had a statement in there, the right kind of jobs to the right people. Now, uh, I do want to make it very clear that I find I'm uncomfortable with the idea that, uh, you know, uh, this is done in a planning sort of way. Uh, most of the uh, jobs of the future are still not known and they may emerge out of uh, areas that we have not imagined. So I am a little uh, uncomfortable with this idea about having top-down policies uh, to try and guess where these jobs will pop up from. Um, policy makers and bureaucrats are notoriously poor at being able to guess that. So I think what really matters is to maintain uh, open policies, allow for creative destruction, allow for um, flexibility, uh, make sure that the frameworks in which uh, entrepreneurs, startups, companies, and individuals take decisions remains uh, as easy as possible. So that there's ease of living, ease of doing business, so that as things evolve, uh, new new sectors arise and so on, uh, we are able. Our job market is able to evolve with it. Uh, so I think that is very important. That you, we create the conditions for this evolution rather than try and guess where those jobs will be. Um, as I said, I, I am very, very skeptical of the ability of policymakers to be able to guess where they will be. Right. I love your honesty. One last question to you, sir. In fact, not even a question, but you know, we at Times Network strongly believe, and it has been part of our uh, many initiatives and conversations, that India doesn't only have the demographic dividend, we also have a very strong democracy dividend, especially in the current scheme of things or the current global scenario, uh, it is a huge plus that we are a strong democracy in 70, 75th year of independence and uh, it, it provides, uh, you know, to a great extent it provides stability and predictability of the way country will move or the policies will evolve. What is your take on that? How do we capitalize on this democratic dividend apart from demographic dividend? Well, I think we Indians are way too apologetic about the noisiness of our democracy. Um, it's noisy. There's lots of uh, opinions that bounce about. Um, and sadly, uh, we tend to um, sort of think that that is uh, somehow a, uh, a disadvantage. My own view is that, look, since my um, entire basis of my argument is that you allow for uh, churn of creative destruction of of all kinds of flexibility well in that context democracy if uh, it's also true in the political sphere as far as democracy is concerned there's lots of let let different people come up with new ideas let that churn uh, some of them will get tried out in different states the better ones will presumably survive and so on and so in that way we will make our way forward. So this allows for a certain amount, degree of flexibility that, for example, other systems may not have. But it does require one thing, that we as Indians have faith in this messy process. Um, and as I, as I said right at the beginning, uh, we are way too apologetic about this, uh, especially when we are dealing with um, you know, foreign media critics, for example. Uh, you know, we tend to uh, get all very defensive. There's no reason for us to be defensive, whether it's in terms of the way our system, the messy as it is, maybe, maybe, or in terms of our uh, pursuit of national interests um, in uh, international forums. There is absolutely no reason for us to be apologetic. Uh, we are now the world's fastest growing economy, uh, democracy or otherwise. Um, as far as, you know, while I, I always take forecasts with a pinch of salt, at least for this year and next year, um, the IMF clearly forecasts us to be growing at uh, much higher rates than even China, and I think that is sustainable. Uh, so I think we are on a good uh, wicket here, and uh, we should um, pursue our, uh, you know, rational policies as far as we can, maintain, uh, you know, flexibility, uh, continue to pursue international export markets, um, upgrade our technology, and in every one of these spheres, not be apologetic.
Absolutely. So thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure having you on this special episode of uh, India Growth Mission. Thank you so much. Thank you.